Well, good evening and uh, nearly happy Sabbath. Greetings to you from Andrews University and the seminary. It's certainly good to join you in, uh, in Virginia tonight to, uh, to come back to your uh, wonderful camp meeting. I uh, practiced law for a number of years in Washington, D.C., and during that time I had a brother-in-law who was a pastor here in Virginia, Harry Sharley. If any of you remember him, he was at the, the Whitfield Church and the Waynesboro Church, pastored in both places and is now in Washington State. But now um, I have come to this camp meeting because uh, of, uh, of our connection with him a number of times before. So it's good to be back on your lovely campus and in this uh, very impressive and friendly building. So thank you for having me. And thank you for the, uh, the music uh, that we've been blessed with this evening. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the battle between truth and falsehood for the good or the evil side. Great, great poem from the 19th century that speaks a great truth about history. As a historian, I believe this, that to nations and individuals come moments of moral conflict and hopefully moral clarity and you choose the the right side and how appropriate the words today the battle between truth and falsehood we hear an awful lot about false news fake news but which side is it on right everyone's convinced that the fake news is on the other side I think there's something our prophetic heritage as Adventists should tell us and I don't know if we're touching on it this weekend but the king of the north and the king of the south I think that prophetic insight should let us know that there's fake news on both sides right and as Adventists we're in danger if we uncritically and fully embrace either side of our political spectrum can you see that that there are problems we may have a we may have a sympathy perhaps more for one side or the other and that may be okay because actually both sides have some legitimate concerns and some values that they're standing for but they're doing it in an incomplete and at times extreme way and the biblical position will overlap perhaps with some on both sides but it will be a distinct and unique position that the Adventist Church and other Protestants and other people of faith and moral clarity um, should be called to and understand. And I'm hoping that this weekend will bring some of those moderating positions to our mind more clearly and we can see the dangers of embracing either extreme. I was also blessed by the earlier song service, um, particularly that, that very beautiful uh, modern song, Oceans right being called to walk out upon the waters uh, oceans deep where feet may fail such powerful language and we speak it so uh, sing it so movingly and yet how many of us really want to walk out upon the waters right or how many of us are content with where we are and what we know and we want to defend what we've had from the past uh, and make no movements into the unknown right that's much more comfortable you know our pioneers understood what that was about moving out beyond the, your comfort zone into new truths the Sabbath for instance moving beyond where it, those around them were studying and, and believing into something new and unexpected now I was raised a Seventh-day Adventist so I never had that experience in terms of understanding something new about the Sabbath. It was the way I was raised. Um, and many of us, perhaps some of you did come in from the Sabbath, but that's been years ago. Maybe some of you were raised in it. What is there about our prophetic understanding? Do we know it all? Are there things we need to learn and move towards? Can we have the faith to hear that voice calling us to new understandings and new perspectives on the world in which we live to think about our faith maybe in ways we haven't thought about it before it's easy to sing about it maybe a little more difficult to do I'm praying for that openness of mind as we look at our topic tonight I want to uh, share a couple of resources with you um, that will relate to
the topics I'm speaking of this weekend. Uh, last year was the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. In fact, that makes its way into my title tonight, 500 Years of Protest and Liberty. And um, in, uh, in preparation for that, I wrote a book called The Reformation and the Remnant. What can the ideas of the Protestant Reformers tell us about some of the conflicts we have in our own church today? And this is broader than religious liberty, uh, questions about the authority of Scripture. How do we understand how to apply Scripture in our church and to the conflicts and the discussions we sometimes have? Conflicts and discussions over um, creation and evolution, over ordination and gender, over last day events, Sunday laws, and issues of religious liberty. I think it's an important uh, the study of history can be an important way of diffusing and lessening conflicts in our church today. I think part of the reason we're so um, divided at times is because of a lack of understanding and knowledge about the history of our own church and the history of Protestantism generally. And we get caught up in the divides that are infecting our larger society. Those that are not aware of history are doomed to repeat its mistakes, and we must avoid that. The, the, the other book that uh, just came out last year, 500 Years of Protest and Liberty, and this is especially about the development of religious freedom and civil liberties from the time of Martin Luther to Martin Luther King Jr. and all the way up to the election of 2016 and uh, Donald Trump. What does all of this mean in the light of prophecy and history? We're going to be touching on some of these topics both tonight and tomorrow, and the ABC should have uh, both of these resources for those that want to go more in depth. A question we're faced with is, so you can see my subtitle here, How to Make America Great Again, Again. It's been a question that's been asked quite seriously over the last year or two, hasn't it? It's become a common theme or a common motto of, uh, of last year's political campaign. But as a historian, it kind of drove me a little bit nuts because it seemed to assume that we were great at some point and lost that greatness. And the question is, when were we great and when did we lose it? Because if you ask different people, you get very different answers. So say, for instance, let's say you ask an African-American about when America was great and when it lost its greatness. And if you ask about our founding period, when we had slavery, um, they will question whether America was truly great at that period of time. And can you um, blame them? for asking that question? If your ancestors were enslaved for a period of time, there might be a question mark as to whether in fact that was a moment of true greatness. And so I've put the, the, the again in parentheses because what you view as greatness may depend on where you stand and who you are. And especially with a church of the diversity of ours, we're needing to become more sympathetic, perhaps, to voices that weren't taken so seriously in the past. For an African-American, perhaps America's greatness starts after the Civil War, or maybe after the civil rights movements of the 1950s and 60s. So the question becomes, does the arc of American Protestantism and greatness run from Martin Luther to Martin Luther King Jr. and civil rights uh, uh, for minorities, or to Donald Trump and white Christian America? And the answer to that question will determine what you think America needs to get back to. But I don't want to use just human reason tonight. I want to look at what inspired sources tell us about the basis and source of America's greatness. And However you think about America and its greatness, whether it's relatively great or not, we have to acknowledge that most of the world views something significant and even great about America. 
Wherever I travel, there are people who want to come to America, whether it be from South America or Africa, Asia, other parts of the world. So something we've done, despite our shortcomings and failures, despite slavery, despite treatment of the Native Americans, despite, and we can list a series of shortcomings that we should take seriously, but in spite of these, there was something that made America a beacon of freedom for the world because people want to immigrate here. They did in the past and they still want to. And if we go to inspired sources, Ellen White in The Great Controversy says something uh, quite straightforward and clear. She said this about America's greatness. Republicanism and Protestantism became the fundamental principles of the nation. These principles are the secret of its power and its prosperity. You could say power and prosperity is in some ways a synonym of greatness, right? If we're losing power and prosperity, we're losing our greatness. But notice which came first, the power and prosperity or the commitment to certain important fundamental principles? Republicanism and Protestantism. Let me start with the easy one. Are we clear on what Republicanism and Protestantism are? What is Protestantism as Ellen White uses it here? Has anyone read the chapter in the Great Controversy on the protest of the princes? Protestantism becomes shorthand for what fundamental freedom? Religious freedom, the protest of the princes. In matters of conscience, said the princes, the Lutheran princes, the majority shall have no say. Thus was born the fundamental principle that's enshrined in our Bill of Rights. We're in a democracy, but when it comes to a fundamental right, we're anti-democratic. Do you realize that? The Bill of Rights is meant to be a bulwark against the decisions of the majority, and that is Protestantism, because these princes launched a protest against the emperor that said, in matters of conscience, the majority shall have no say, and they became known as the Protestant princes, and then that name was attached to the larger Protestant uh, reformed world that Luther and Calvin led out in. So the very word and name Protestant originates with the belief in religious freedom. And thus Protestantism becomes shorthand for a belief in religious freedom and the separation of church and state. So we should be quite familiar with that idea. But there's a second idea here, republicanism. Republicanism and Protestantism. What does republicanism stand for? What does it mean? I see somebody uh, nodding or shaking, uh, shaking a head. And a clue is, it doesn't mean the Republican Party, right? It's not republicanism as opposed to, to democ the, the Democrats. It's lowercase r. Both Democrats and Republicans have a commitment to a Republican form of government, which is a government that is elected how? By the people and elected for who? For the people and made up of the people. So Lincoln's great definition of, uh, of government, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people is one of the best definitions you can have for a Republican government. You could actually elect a dictator or a king, couldn't you? So a democracy isn't necessarily a republic. A republic has to not only have popular vote, but it also needs to actually run and operate and be responsive to the people and be based on the rule of law, that the laws are applied equally to all people, fairly and justly, and that we guarantee these things. In fact, the Constitution guarantees to each state a republican form of government. And it means that you have a separation of powers between the three branches of government, uh, the executive, the judicial, and the um, legislative, and that you have checks and balances between the three branches of governments. Because our founders had a Christian understanding of human nature. Did you know that? Madison and others whose house we will visit on, on Sunday said that if governments were made for angels, you wouldn't need the separation of powers and checks and balances. But they're made for greedy, fallen human beings, 
And therefore, we need to build into the system an inefficient bureaucratic set of operations that will help maintain our freedoms and the rule of law in our country. So Ellen White notices both of these features, republicanism and Protestantism. And if you go to that same page in Great Controversy 441, you'll see that she, that she discusses these, that she, that she defines these terms in the way that I have here. So republicanism and Protestantism, and it wasn't just understood by Ellen White, it was largely understood by American historians that these were two great principles. And Adventists believed that these principles were captured in their prophetic message. Maybe we can go to Revelation 13 for a moment. Do you remember this? Um, and it's I'm, I'm missing a uh, a one there. It's actually Revelation 13:11, not 13:1. Um, it says, "I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke." like a dragon revelation 13 11. now if you go to the verse just prior to that it talks about uh, he who leads into captivity must go into captivity he who is killed by the sword must be killed by the sword he who kills with the sword must be killed by the sword and our pioneers were not alive when that prophecy was fulfilled but they inherited it from other protestants who believed that that was a reference to what event in history. Does anyone know this is back to high school, maybe college prophecy class? 1798, Napoleon's general Berthier taking the Pope into captivity. 1798, the next verse is out a beast which represents a nation arising out of the earth which means a less populated place uh, that has a special power configuration represented by these two lamb-like horns. In 1798, what nation was arriving out of a fairly relatively unpopulated place that had a special arrangement of powers? Well, it was pretty clear to Protestants at the time and to our pioneers that that could be none other than the United States of America. And the lamb-like qualities of these two horns represented the religious freedom as well as the government run justly and equally on behalf of the people rather than on behalf of kings and queens and dictators. Now there's a second part to this, not just the two horns, but it spoke like a dragon. Speaking like a dragon in the context of the book of Revelation meant what? Peace and freedom and equality? Or something quite different? Something coercive? Uh, something overbearing, something persecuting, right? That's the, the image that comes out. So we have a country that on one hand upholds these great ideals, but on the other hand will speak out of the other side of its mouth, if you will, speak in a way that is contrary to those ideals. And if you remember your Bible class in academy or in college, when do most Adventists view America speaking as a dragon? What is the event that demonstrates this turn of events or change of circumstances? I think I heard it here, Sunday laws, right? When there's an imposition of worship, which we understand as being around the Sabbath Sunday question. And that's the way I grew up, right? Our country is a lamb-like beast that's gentle with liberty and justice for all, but someday in the future there will be a change and there will be Sunday laws and we need to worry about that and, and, uh, and look for that and that will be the sign when we should speak up on behalf of religious freedom and truth and justice. But then I began to read what the pioneers actually had to say about this. And I came to understand that this was only half true. That they did indeed see a time in the future that this would be, speaking as a dragon, would be most fully represented by coercive kinds of worship at a certain point in time. But that it wasn't just something that lay in the future. And in fact, if we look at the Bible, does the way this describes uh, the two horns and speaking as a dragon, 
Is there a, tie, a sequence of time between those two events? The text doesn't actually seem to suggest it. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. You could imply a period of time in there, but you could also see that it reads that this is happening at the same time. And lo and behold, I discovered that the pioneers themselves believed this. So, um, the first evidence that I found of this is before the church was officially organized as the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but we did have the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald together, and it was there was certainly an organized body of believers that are recognizable as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And in 1853, Uriah Smith, the famous author of Daniel and Revelation that you're all familiar with, he takes this idea of the lamb-like beast and he applies it to something happening in America then. And um, he uh, writes a very long poem that you can look up if you like yourself, the 23rd of June, 1853. And he talks in the first verse about the lamb-like beast that arises and the two horns being the two fundamental principles which lead the nation. Um, more lamb-like in their outward form and name, a land of freedom pillared on the broad and open basis of equality, a land reposing neath the gentle sway of civil and religious liberty. Lamb-like in form, is there no dragon voice heard in our land? No notes that harshly grate upon the ear of mercy, love, and truth? and put humanity to open shame? Then he answers the question. Let the united cry of millions tell, millions that groan beneath oppression's rod, beneath the sin-forged chains of slavery, robbed of their rights to brutes degraded down and soul and body bound to others' will. Let their united cries and tears and groans that daily rise and call aloud on heaven for vengeance answer. Let the slave reply. O land of boasted freedom, thou hast given the lie to all thy loud professions, first of justice, liberty, and equal rights, and thou hast set a foul and heinous blot upon the sacred page of liberty, and whilst thou trafficest in souls of men, thou hurlst defiance proud in face of heaven, soon to be answered with avenging doom. So it was clear at least to the leading thinkers among our pioneers, that this speaking as a dragon was actually being fulfilled to some degree in their day by the institution of slavery. They not only thought this, they wrote about it in the pages of our leading publication and predicted that there would be some catastrophe happening to the country because of it. You might say they predicted the Civil War. Ellen White certainly did, and she said that it was because of the sins of the nation and the Christian church in tolerating the evils of racism and slavery. Powerful prophetic voice in that day. Okay, so slavery's over, at least in its legal aspects. I said this the other night, and people said, well, there's still forced servitude, and there is human trafficking and other instances of slavery. But at least it's not legal, at least the authorities work against it. In that day, this was legalized, oppressive slavery, uh, uh, formally recognized and accepted by the government. But 50 years later, Uriah Smith was still talking about the speaking like a dragon of the American government. It was actually not just Uriah Smith. How many of you heard of A.T. Jones, famous advocate of religious uh, freedom as well as righteousness by faith, the 1880 message. And he and Uriah Smith were now co-editors of the Review and Herald. Remarkable run Uriah Smith has. This is about 50 years later and he's still editing the, the Review. The occasion is the Spanish-American War and American military action in the Philippines. Can you imagine today uh, the review talking about American foreign policy in some highly critical way? It probably wouldn't happen, and maybe for good reason, but our pioneers were willing to speak prophetic truths to power that they thought were misusing that power. And on this occasion, and uh, I'm not sure who was the primary penman, but they both have their names attached to it,
Again, they talk about the two horns of the lamb-like beast, talking, uh, pointing out this was Protestantism and Republicanism, and that the beast would speak like a dragon and move away from both of these principles. And about halfway down the quote, um, they say, For several years we said much, never half enough, about the apostasy of the nature from its fundamental principle of Protestantism, but very little has been said about the apostasy of the nation from its fundamental principle of republicanism. Yet this is a truth as really is the other. Just now, the fact pointed out in that truth is being worked out before the eyes of all people. And for months past it has been so. This apostasy is going steadily on in the presence of all. All people are interested in or discussing it daily. The national movements that mark this apostasy. But how many of them see in it the word of God? How many of them see in it the prophecy? How many of them know that there is any word of God in prophecy on the subject? Yea, how many Seventh-day Adventists are telling them of this and showing them the word of prophecy? Yet Seventh-day Adventists are here for that very purpose. Seventh-day Adventists profess to know these things. Our very profession proclaims that we know these things. Are you telling the people? Are you pointing out to them the true significance of the things which they all see as the days go by? If not, why? Is it possible that you yourself, a Seventh-day Adventist, do not know this? Is it possible that you yourself do not see in the Word of God the prophecy which points out this apostasy from the principle of republicanism in this nation? And are you thus letting pass by to be lost forever this great time and mighty opportunity to deliver the message which God has given you for just such a time as this, and which is the very substance of your name and profession as a Seventh-day Adventist? Why, well, that's quite strong language. He seemed to take quite seriously the principle of republicanism, not just religious freedom and the Sabbath directly, but other ways in which the nation could trample on fundamental human rights and due process of law and oppress people in a way that was contrary to our prophetic message. It's interesting that the Spanish-American War was the first time that we know of that American military engaged in waterboarding and the kinds of enhanced interrogation practices that were revived again in the last decade or two in the War on Terror. This is part of what Jones and Smith are speaking to. The abuse of, um, of, of foreigners, of those deemed terrorists, uh, without due process in an inhumane way. What about Ellen White? I quoted earlier how she said that the principles of republicanism and Protestantism were the secret of America's success and prosperity, power and prosperity. She also said this, what should happen if the nation should move away from those principles. And as I grew up and, and, and studied at, at academy and college, it seemed to me that, well, once Sunday laws come in, then that's, that's when America apostatizes. That's when it moves into the coercion of worship. But this quote here shows that it's a broader idea. Under the influence of the threefold union, apostate Protestantism, a renewed Roman medieval church, and spiritualism, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a, as a Protestant and Republican government. Right? She doesn't just limit it to Protestantism, but the principles of Republicanism, the rule of law, the separation of powers, those things that causes the government to work on, by, and behalf of the people. Then we shall know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. As your pastor said this evening, can we see that the end is near in the events being reported around us? In the events that suggest very fundamental and foundational principles of our government are under duress, are under criticism, are under attack? And then she says, this national apostasy is the signal 
for national ruin. Is it possible for Adventists in the 20th and the 21st centuries to overlook crucial prophetic elements of our message because we focus only on half of that message? Have we become accustomed to talking only about religious freedom and Sabbath and Sunday and losing sight of this other half of the prophetic equation and prophetic end time events are unfolding around us and we are only dimly and partially aware of them because we have had our attention diverted, we have taken our eyes off the complete ball and we're only seeing half of it. Are we so focused on Protestantism, religious freedom, that we overlook other fundamental assaults on human rights through violation of the basic principles of Protestantism? Now this isn't just a theoretical question about the future. We can look at history and see that the answer to that question has been yes has been yes. In World War II in Germany and Italy and the rise of and Austria the rise of fascism took place and it was a bit different than our carefully laid out eschatological scenario had prepared for. In focusing on Protestantism and the evils that existed at the time Ellen White was writing The Great Controversy she focused on a certain threat which I believe will continue and the things she said will happen but she doesn't necessarily describe everything that will happen and this was the mistake perhaps that some of the Adventists in Germany fell into because Hitler and the Nazis were against the godless communists they were also against Catholic priests they were pro-family uh, Hitler was a vegetarian, a teetotaler, and he gave Adventist soldiers Saturday mornings off to attend church. No Sunday laws. So, it didn't check the right boxes in our eschatological perspective, and so our question was, well, what could the problem be? And it's a very sobering thing to go back and read the Adventist periodicals in Germany during this period which systematically and regularly praised Hitler and what he was doing for the country and what he was doing for the world. And I don't do this to tell stories on other Adventists. They're well aware of this and you can find if you Google it an apology that the Adventist Church in Germany and Austria um, issued in 2005 on the 60th anniversary of World War II apologizing for both being supportive of the Nazi regime and, and I think most sadly of all, when the Nazis asked for the Christian churches to turn over Jewish members, even though they were Christians, you see under the Nazi outlook it didn't matter if you converted to Christianity, by blood you were still a Jew. And so they required that all the Christian churches turn over their Jews. Have you heard of the Confessing Church? The Confessing Church, um, Karl Barth, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was uh, eventually martyred. Well, this was the moment when they stood up and said, no, right? The blood of Christ covers everyone. We cannot accept this. And they went underground. Unfortunately, um, the Adventist Church, most of them anyway, turned over their Jewish members. Now, this wasn't all. There were some faithful individuals who protected Jews. There's the book by Hazel that talks about a thousand shall fall. They, they protected and, and, and helped the Jews. Uh, uh, Eric Widener, do I have his first name right? The Seventh Escape also rescued hundreds of Jews through Austria. But on the whole, we didn't do a good job because we focused exclusively on those concerns such as the Sabbath that were most important to us and we didn't see the larger moral issues that were unfolding before our very eyes we were asleep at the switch and if you wonder sometimes why hasn't Christ come before now I think part of that answer lies in the experience of the German church in some ways the last days came to Germany in the 1930s and 1940s and the Adventist church wasn't ready for it it was if you will deceived, fooled, it didn't see the big picture, it didn't see the larger moral issues we wouldn't make the same kind of mistake again, would we?
we wouldn't focus on the wrong things and not see some of the right things. The 21st century has seen a rise of something called nationalistic Christendom. Nationalistic Christendom. Sometimes I, in, in, in my classes I talked about what's the difference between Christianity and Christendom. Right? Some people conflate these things, put these things together. They're the same thing. Christianity is just a Christian dumb is just a more formal version of Christianity. Is that true? Does anyone here have another definition for Christian dumb? What is Christian dumb? I've got some former students in my classes here. Maybe I didn't make that definition clear enough at the time. But I've improved since then. That was a few years ago. Uh, Right. So far from being the same thing, there's a good argument to be made that Christian dumb is actually a heresy of Christianity. Like Christian dumb is what happens when Christianity is taken up and made a formal part of a political, civil, civil legal environment. It is what you would use to describe the church and the state during the Middle Ages. Most of uh, European countries are still called Christendom because despite being intensely and overwhelmingly secular, the European countries actually, most of them, have official established churches. Right? The Church of England, the Queen is still head of it. Christendom. Christendom. Christendom, Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world and my servants do not take up the sword to fight. Therefore, creating a Christian nation where Christian uh, principles and spiritual values are enforced by law is actually a good case to be made a perversion of, an aberration from, a heresy of Christianity. So Christian dumb and Christianity far from being the same uh, and it was the Emperor Constantine of course who first formally put this into place and here in the 21st century we're seeing a rise of the West's Christian heritage. Populist leaders in America and Europe uh, speak for something they call the national heritage, mainstream Christianity, and promise to return it to a position of influence and power. If you look at European politics these days, various nationalist groups play their Christian identity against the non-Christian roots of many immigrants, especially Muslim groups. It's about preserving Christendom against the outsiders. But the way that that's carried out is often clearly not in a very Christian manner, right? Because you can have Christendom, which is a cultural view of Christianity. Some of these European countries actually have quite strict Sunday laws already, at least Sunday closing laws. But hardly any of them are going to church on Sunday. So what does that tell you? Does it tell you that's real Christianity? Or does it tell you it's a cultural form of a way that we divide ourselves from other people? And in fact use this religious identity not as a genuine form of spirituality but as a way to assert who we are as the majority and marginalize and sideline other people. Could such a thing happen in our own country? I would suggest this kind of Christianity has much more to do with medieval versions of Christianity, supporting centralized power structures in both church and state. Unbelievers and non-Christians are dealt with as civil enemies, dealt with by force, whether by e e imprisonment, expulsion, careful travel bans at home or military action overseas. We haven't returned to the Middle Ages, but there are some worrying signs that rhetoric and plans to implement this kind of Christianity are not far from many people's minds. After 500 years of Protestantism, we are having a clash of Protestant visions of America. Uh, in Charlottesville last year, there was a clash of differing views of America, weren't there? Ostensibly represented by Protestant viewpoints on both sides. One side says that America is best represented by a Christ Christian tradition and culture, primarily from Northern European cultures and countries. 
And those who cannot adopt or adapt to these views and values should not come to or perhaps even stay in America. There's another view that says America is best represented by the kind of Protestantism that extends tolerance and liberty to all religions and cultures and that its values are best seen in its commitment to liberty and justice for all. What does history tell us about the true Protestant identity of America? And I want to look at a connection between two men, Martin Luther and Martin Luther King Jr. This year was the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And it's funny how serendipity works, and maybe it's providence. Because 50 years ago was the 450th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And that was the year that Martin Luther King Jr. made a very powerful speech that's not necessarily one of his most famous, but maybe one of his most significant. April 4, 1967. And in that speech, he showed that he shared with his namesake more than just a name, but that he understood and tapped into an underlying Protestant tradition that went all the way back to Martin Luther and is of central importance to the Adventist church. In that speech, it was a turning point for some of you who know his history. He primarily started with issues of racial justice for black African Americans here in America. But towards the end of his life, he somewhat controversially began to speak out on other issues like poverty f for all, whites and blacks. And he spoke against the Vietnam War. And many people questioned why he would do this and watered down his own cause. But it revealed a couple of things about him. He wasn't a perfect man by any means, but it did show that there were some principles he was standing for that were larger than himself. That he could speak on behalf of not just his people, but also of other people that were oppressed. And that the principles that he drew from were truly in the Protestant tradition. This is what he said at the beginning of that speech tonight. I must be true to my conviction that I share with all men the calling to be a son of the living God. Beyond the calling of race or nation or creed is this vocation of sonship and brotherhood. And because I believe that the Father is deeply concerned, especially for his suffering and helpless and outcast children, I come tonight to speak for them. And what did he speak about? He spoke about the triplets of materialism, um, capitalism, and racism that undermined the spiritual commitments of the nation to minorities both in America and around the world. And the war in Vietnam was based in part upon American business interests, the interests of the colonizers that had been there and that we had allowed materialism and avarice to interfere with and poison the American soul in relation to its universal love for humanity and its respect for the image of God in all people. Interestingly enough, Martin Luther did a very similar thing. Now we think of Martin Luther in terms of righteousness by faith and sola scriptura, sola fide. But what was the event that caused him to come to public attention? Was he speaking just positively about scripture and faith and grace? Or was he attacking something? What was he attacking? System of indulgences where the spiritual and the uh, civil leaders had got together to sell indulgences undermining through the use of misuse of economics the spiritual and social and financial welfare of the people. And many historians believe that if Luther had just spoken against uh, in favor of the authority of scripture and the importance of grace that no one would have noticed him. That it was his taking these principles 
of scriptural authority and the importance of grace and applying them to the misuse of power of his day that actually caused there to be the conflict which made people notice what he had to say. And many people hated him. But he removed many people from the subjection and subjugation of both spiritual and material oppression. And I think the same can be said of Martin Luther King Jr. Many people hated him, but he removed many people from systematic, official, formal racism. And it was in part due to his courage that today we have a country that is much more equal and that the spiritual values that he stood for have actually become part of our legal system and its recognition of equality. I want to close in my last few minutes to explore more fully a theological idea that's very important to Luther and to us and should help frame the discussion for the weekend. What time am I supposed to be done here? Fifteen minutes ago. <laughs> Ten minutes? Okay, that's good. What is the priesthood of all believers? And I think that this doctrine shows us the connection between religious freedom and issues of biblical and social justice in our society. It shows the connection between Protestantism and Republicanism and why our prophetic message may need to be a bit broader than we've more recently thought. So I want to talk about Martin Luther and the world that he was born into. It was a world that believed in God. You could hardly ever find an atheist. But did that make it a wonderful world of freedom and equality? No, it didn't. So a belief in God itself is not sufficient to give you a society of equality and fairness and justice. They believed in God, and, and that T at the top stands for truth and God and God's truth. And they believed in a capital T truth that everyone could know. But underneath it, do I have a pointer? I do. Um, they believed in church and the state. And the C, capital C, stands for the fact that the church is the senior partner in this relationship, right? Who crowned the Pope when Charlemagne was around? Charlemagne crowned... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting it backwards. The Pope crowned Charlemagne, right? Showing that he was the senior authority. And these two entities work together to oversee the individual. All truth, spiritual truth, as well as philosophical, uh, political truths, were mediated by the church and state to the individual. Now this had some real significance. Because in this framework, then, church and state, there was no separation between them, but they cooperated with each other. The state would enforce the beliefs and teachings of the church. And the individual is lower capital here, right? Pretty unimportant. People existed in groups. You were more known for being a peasant or an artisan or a stonemason rather than an individual. And... Uh, there was no such thing as fundamental human rights because the basic human right, the first freedom, is conscience. Now, if conscience is the claim that God is telling you to do something that is contrary to what either the church or the state want, how can that even happen here? Because it's the church and the state that are telling you what God wants. So, so to speak of conscience as a separate thing outside this church-state arrangement is to speak nonsense. And if there is no conscience, then really there was no way for other rights to develop as well because most of our rights spring out of rights of conscience, of religious freedom and worship. If your religious freedom requires you to be able to speak to other people and share your convictions with them, freedom of speech. It requires the right to assemble together and worship with others, freedom of assembly. Uh, it requires you to be able to write and share pamphlets with others, freedom of the press. So all of these things were dependent on the conscience of the individual. Middle Ages, that just did not exist. There could be privileges extended from time to time, but those could easily be withdrawn. What did Martin Luther do? He came along and literally turned the world 
on its head, turn the world upside down. So this is what the priesthood of all believers did. You see this pyramid, the individual used to be down here. Martin Luther says, priesthood of all believers, the individual can access God directly, both through prayer and Bible study, right? The Protestants believe that everyone should study the Bible for himself or herself and that it couldn't be mandated by the government. Now, think about the significance of that for, for a moment. And, and Adventists, you should especially appreciate this. The priesthood of believers is especially connected with the sanctuary. Why did Luther understood this? Because he understood Christ in the heavenly sanctuary that we had direct access to in the book of Hebrews. Ellen White has often said that the sanctuary message is the foundation for our beliefs. And she speaks even more broadly about Protestantism. And it wasn't until I studied this that I realized not so much in just understanding 1844 and the Day of Atonement, but in understanding Christ's high priestly ministry, the sanctuary message has arguably had the biggest impact of any teaching of the church on Western political and social arrangements. Because it's that doctrine that teaches us we have a direct access to God which the church and the state must respect. And out of this then arises, Luther could say, I stand on the word of God before the emperor and the pope and I must obey God. The Protestant princes, in matters of conscience, the majority shall have no say. Suddenly the very idea of rights becomes possible. And it's not a year or two or even a decade or two, it's hundreds of years, but you can see political philosophers using these terms, the right of private judgment in matters of biblical interpretation, means that states can't pass laws telling you what to believe about the Bible. So there's now a separation between church and state because if the individual has a right to worship God as the best of his convictions, the church shouldn't force it, and neither should the state. So each of them now become oops, sovereign masters of their own realms, but they're limited in what they can enforce. The state can only enforce temporal matters, matters dealing with harms and injuries in this world, and the church can't enforce things through the use of civil force and power. It can only excommunicate or disfellowship. In fact, we believe that up until this very day. So this was a dramatic revolution in the way that the world was understood. And I think there's no better way of understanding how we went from the divine right of kings to Luther, to Abraham Lincoln's government of the people and by the people and for the people then the fact that this view of the world of Martin Luther became generally widespread through Europe, most clearly in England, and then was expressed most fully in the foundations of the United States. Protestantism, this was John Locke, began to teach that the duties to God could not be interfered with by man, as they were a duty that existed between God and the individual, and the individual had a right not to be interfered with by the state in the exercise of that duty. The right against the state grew out of the individual's duty towards God. And this is something that James Madison himself said, whose home we're going to visit on Sunday. Before man is a citizen of the earthly kingdom, he is a citizen of the heavenly kingdom. And as you must keep your allegiances to the more superior power unaffected by those to inferior powers, so you cannot subject your conscience to the state, and therefore we must have a First Amendment. Now, Ellen White commented on this notion of rights and duties. The Lord Jesus demands our acknowledgement of the rights of every man. Men's social rights and their rights as Christians are to be taken into consideration. I need to show you one more chart because showing you only those first two gets you only into 19th century America. And to understand the day we live in, you have to understand the rise of something called modernism and postmodernism. So this chart's a little bit different. At the top, we don't have one big T. We have what? A whole bunch of small T's. 
Have you heard the statement, your truth may be your truth, but it's not my truth? Right? That's the culture that we live in today. That describes the millennials, that describes most of the young people that surround us. There's a subjectivity of truth, and the individual is still considered to be important, but I've put him lower case, him or her, because if there's no absolute truths about human nature or the individual, then really you tend to default to majoritarian truths, and soon the majority overruns the individual. Church and state are still separate, but now look at church is a lowercase c, and state is a higher case c. Because if your rights depend on a kind of uncertainty of truth, who are those people that threaten freedoms the most? People who are certain about what they believe. And who are those people? People like you. Religious people that go to church and read the Bible, and therefore we have to create a separation of church and state to keep those people out of the public square, right? So there's two kinds of separation of church and state. There's one that the, our founders, the Protestants implemented that was a healthy balance between the two, but there's a second one that grew up in the 19th and 20th centuries that marginalized and put religion and religious people to the side. And this Supreme Court case that we just had, we're gonna talk about tomorrow, the religious freedom and LGBT rights. There's a strong movement in our country that religious freedom should always lose to LGBT rights, right? And that's based on this model of church and state, where the secularist values always overcome the religious values. Fortunately, the decision that came down came down in a more balanced way, and we'll talk about that more tomorrow. So I want to, we have these three models in mind, I hope, and it, they in part explain the conflicts in the world that we live in today. If I drew a chart, and I usually do, and maybe I'll share one tomorrow, that certain news outlets base their view of the world largely on this kind of skeptical liberal model, right? And we call those the liberal news outlets. Other news outlets base theirs more on this model moving more that direction. We're gonna implement Christian America with these values that need to be reflected in the law. And, and these two kinds of media are shooting at each other. And both of them are tending to overlook this model here, which is our true prophetic heritage, our true Protestant heritage as Americans. We can't buy into the narratives of the extremes on either side. We have to become more familiar and more aware of our own Adventist prophetic heritage in the middle, understanding that morality is important, but also freedom is important. And I want to make sure we end this on a really important spiritual note, because there's a lot of history here and a lot of philosophy that I think is important, but it only has its true value when it's seen in the light of this passage from Matthew 24 and a very sobering passage that really describes in many ways the times in which we live then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me verse 10 of chapter 24 at that time many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other so it's bad enough to be persecuted but this seems to envision you won't just be persecuted by non-Christian outsiders who hate your faith, but that believers will turn on each other, right? That you will be betrayed and hated by those that were your brother and your sister. America is, you know, this is what's so distressing about America today in many ways, right? We're turning on each other. This recent election, it's, it's come out pretty clearly that there's been a lot of fake news, intentionally fake news, by our enemies, our genuine national enemies, Russia, ran a lot of ads on both sides of the partisan divide. And they didn't care who they were criticizing. They were just trying to rile you up or rile the other side up, right? They said false things about Hillary Clinton. They said false things about Donald Trump. And they sat back to watch the unfolding fights and disunity. Do you think Satan is as clever as the Russians? <laughs> 
Do you think Satan is trying to do a similar thing to our church? Trying to divide us? Doesn't matter what the beliefs are. It doesn't even matter if you hold a true belief. If you carry it out and impose it or argue for it in a hostile, angry, vindictive way, Satan's all the more pleased, right? Uh, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the, this is the key verse, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, right? That is the real danger, the love of most growing cold. Your love for your fellow church member, the disputes, the dissensions, you can no longer love. The next verse may be slightly more famous, but he who stands firm to the end or he who endures to the end will be saved. Now, we often think of enduring to the end about being tough and patient and long-lasting and courageous, and, and all those things can be part of it. But look at the immediate context. The immediate context is about love. The immediate context is, will your love endure to the end? In the way you relate to others that you see things slightly differently with, are you expressing those differences? And I'm, look, I'm a lawyer and I'm a historian, so I deal with differences all the time. Right? Daniel and Reed know they follow my Facebook page, and there's differences on that page. But do we have a commitment to expressing those differences in a way that tells the other person you care about them and that you love them? And that is the message that needs to come out of this ultimately in the end. And that is what I can hope that we do this weekend as we continue to discuss these very important issues. Can I close with a word of prayer or is that somebody else's job or? Uh, Daniel, please. Yeah, that would be nice. I guess. It was good that we were here and we we're just getting started. So we thank you, uh, Dr. Miller, for bringing this. Let us uh, bow our heads as we close with prayer. Father, our hearts have been stirred because the relevance of what we are discussing this weekend is seen uh, all throughout. We pray, Lord, that as we dive deep into this subject of freedom and religious liberty and the overarching theme of love, Lord, what is it good? What, is, what are all these things good for if we have not love in our hearts? Uh, we pray that you are with us throughout the remainder of this weekend. We pray that you continue to abide here in this place all throughout this campus within our hearts. And as we continue to study this topic, that we move closer to you, closer to your ideal, uh, and closer to loving one another. Thank you, Lord. Be with us as we go our way, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.